Tonight, I'm going to talk about my relationship with a man. A man called Alexis. But he was a man. Alexis de Tocqueville, who uh, died at the age of 53 in 1859. I, I first met Alexis in Oxford, but he's turned up more recently in my life in two rather unexpected locations, once in South Wales and once in Beijing in April. He turned up in South Wales when I bought a house on the South Welsh coast. A rather strange yellow house. I didn't look very closely at the beach when I bought the house. When I did look, I realized that it was entirely covered in plastic bottles and beer cans. The beach itself was entirely invisible under the rubbish. And I asked the locals why this was and whether anything could be done about it since it did rather spoil the effect <laughs> of my coastal view. Well, they replied, there's not much we can do because the council doesn't bloody care. I thought about that for a moment, and I realized that it summed up the attitude of the entire Celtic periphery. <laughs> I grew up in Scotland, and indeed, the whole of Western Europe, towards any problem, even a straightforward problem like litter on the beach. We can't do anything because the local government won't do anything about it. Tocqueville saw that that was all wrong. And I came to realize how right he was. Because I decided to take matters into my own hands. I tried to clear up the beach myself. I was a rather pitiful sight carrying black refuse bags with me wherever I went. But it was more than one individualistic Scotsman could do. And so I asked for volunteers, hoping to shame the locals into clearing up their own beach. But that only enjoyed modest success, even when I offered a free lunch. But then, a voluntary association, the Lions Club, became interested. The Porthcoll branch of the Lions Club made the clear up of the beach their cause. And as a result, entirely through voluntary efforts, without the need for the local council to do anything, we cleared up the beach. And I'm rather proud of that achievement. And Tocqueville would have been proud of it too. And nor would he have been surprised by the fact that the Lions Club, which came to the rescue, was founded in Chicago as a perfect example of the voluntary associations that Tocqueville saw as so integral to American life. I'm going to quote from Democracy in America, published, as you all know, in 1835. America is among the countries of the world the one where they have taken most advantage of association and where they have applied that powerful mode of action to a greater diversity of objects. The inhabitant of the United States learns from birth that he must rely on himself to struggle against the evils and obstacles of life. He has only a defiant and restive regard for social authority, and he appeals to it only when he cannot do without it. In the United States, they associate for the goals of public security, of commerce and industry, of morality and religion. There is nothing the human will despairs of attaining by the free action of the collective power of individuals. Americans of all ages, all conditions, all minds constantly unite. 
Not only do they have commercial and industrial associations in which all take part, but they also have a thousand other kinds, religious, moral, grave, futile, very general and very particular, immense and very small. Americans use associations to give faiths, to found seminaries, to build inns, to raise churches, to distribute books, to send missionaries to the Antipodes. In this manner, they create hospitals, prisons, schools. Finally, if it is a question of bringing to light a truth or developing a sentiment with the support of a great example, they associate. He, he actually cites the case of the temperance movement, which was becoming increasingly influential in the United States when he visited there in the 1830s, noting, and I quote, if those 100,000 members of the American Temperance Society had lived in France, each of them would have addressed himself individually to the government, begging it to oversee the nation's wine bars. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the tragedy of contemporary America is that it has become like the France that Tocqueville mocked. The point that voluntary associations have declined in our society was made now nearly 20 years ago by Robert Putnam in an essay, Bowling Alone, that became justly famous. But since the publication of that essay in 1995, voluntary associations have declined even further. The proportion of Americans who were active members of religious associations in 1995 was still slightly more than half in the most recent survey of 2006, the, the proportion is down to a third. For sports associations, it's gone from 24% to 16%. For arts associations, I suppose this is one, active membership has gone from 22% to 14%, and so on. In every dimension, the voluntary association has continued its decline, as Putnam described it. Essentially, Americans have become like Europeans. Increasingly, they expect the state to deal with their problems, and increasingly, it does, or pretends to. Since 1993, 81,803 new rules, that is to say regulations issued by agencies of the government, as opposed to laws passed by Congress, have been issued. The total costs of all these regulations are approximately $1.8 trillion a year, and that's quite apart from the $3.5 trillion of federal outlays. In other words, the regulatory costs are about 50% more in terms of additional cost of government, or nearly 12% of gross domestic product. If you exclude the blank pages, the 2012 edition of the Federal Register, which lists all these regulations, runs to 78,961 pages. In 1986, it ran to 44,812 pages. In 1936, it ran to just 2,620. Now, of course, the American economy has grown, and American population has grown since 1936 but not that much. Gross domestic product today is roughly 12 times higher in real terms than it was in 1936, but the Federal Register of Regulations is 30 times, three zero times larger than it was then. We have become the regulation nation, and Tocqueville would not recognize us. I meet Tocqueville, as I said earlier, quite a lot these days. He also popped up in Beijing just the other day. I spent a week in Beijing in April, and I really didn't expect to see him there. But there was my old friend at dinner with select plutocrats and party bigwigs in one of the more prosperous outlying gated communities that Beijing now boasts. And I found myself, to my surprise, in a conversation 
about Tocqueville's other great work, The Old Regime and the Revolution, published in 1856. You really need to read these two books together to understand Tocqueville's thought. The central argument of democracy in America is that democracy worked in 1830s America because civil society was so vital, so dynamic, that it acted as a bulwark against the tyranny of the majority and the other pathologies that afflict democracy. The federal system, too, as Tocqueville pointed out, played a part, and so did the religious sects that were such a distinctive feature of American life. This was a pluralistic society in which the power of the state was severely circumscribed, not just by the Constitution, but also by the way society worked. And that, of course, is what is so depressing about the decline and fall of civil society in the contemporary United States. The old regime and the revolution makes a complementary argument. The argument is that the French Revolution of 1789 failed to produce a stable democracy because of certain peculiarities of Ancien Regime France. It was highly centralized. Power was concentrated in Paris. There was a very weak civil society, and the church was also weak. And above all, Frenchmen had a preference for equality over liberty. In Tocqueville's view, the United States put liberty first and tolerated inequality for the sake of that liberty. But in France, it was always equality that took precedence. And if you could get equality by giving up liberty, then the French would give it up. Why then did the discussion turn to Tocqueville in Beijing? Well, let me quote from the Chinese magazine, Kai Xin. Vice Premier Wang Qishan is a Tocqueville fan and has recommended the book to his associates. Troubled by what he sees in the superficial and short-sighted class of nouveau riche, as well in, as in the misguided and naive common people, Wong fears a protracted period of uncertainty and turmoil in the future. I must admit, I read this story with some skepticism, and so I asked at dinner, do you really read Tocqueville? Oh yes, said one of my hosts. In fact, I have my copy in my pocket. <laughs> and he pulled out a Chinese translation of L'Ancien Régime et la Révolution which mightily cheered me. For if the Chinese are aware that they, like the French of the 18th century, have an excessively centralized system, that they, like the French of the 18th century, have too weak a civil society, and that they, too, have a preference for equality over liberty, then at least they are addressing the fundamental problems that they confront. At least they are aware of the dangers they're heading towards. I just wish that we in the United States were also reading Tocqueville with the same degree of seriousness. I wish that we would go back to democracy in America and realize that its implications for the United States today are as grave and as troubling as the implications of Tocqueville's other great work are for China. Thank you very much indeed.